list of the presentation would like to come and sit at the front and we'll have some questions and answers. If we need one more chair. Um, yeah, could you maybe have um, two more, maybe? impression that since anthropology had been separated into biological, linguistic and was it material culture, there has well, okay. an archaeology. There has been a disruption in its capabilities to define itself and has almost just sparked a this sort of like he had this impression, I mean I I've been testing it out, especially among UCL students, <laughs> because you're the only one in London with one that still remains within those segments. He said there is just no discussion across boundaries. <laughs> is, this, is this something that you find this is the case, and do you think it will then, do you think by creating a, a syllabus of yourself which puts them back together, you can create something that defines anthropology? Hopefully in the long one, because we, I think, we experience in our department absolute contestation between all three kind of disciplines. There's no inter dialogue or, or, or anything like that. Mostly. But uh, I suppose this is a kind of long term approach to that, in that maybe in 25 years there'll be uh, enlightened undergraduates that have done a, a primary school course in anthropology. But aside from that, we're kind of starting up an anthropology society where we're organising debates between the disciplines. Um, we didn't talk about that, but that's, that's something that we're trying to do and is really quite new, um, which is sad but good at the same time. Um, so we're trying to get everyone to, to be, debate and we've got one soon and everyone's invited, so. Um, I think it's, sorry, no, I was just gonna say like, I think there's definitely room for them to cross, but it's actually, if the people involved in the separate departments take the initiative to make that cross. And some people are more open to that than others, um, both in the staff and students, really. Because there used to be a course which isn't running anymore called Theory of Mind, and that brought all three departments. It was taught by lecturers from each uh, segment and brought it together, but for some reason that's not running anymore. So. And also, because it, at UCL, we um, undergraduates are, I won't say the word forced, but I couldn't say that. Um, we have to do bio, social, sorry, biological, social, and material culture. So we have to do all three of them in our first year and then in our second year, and then we can specialise in our third year if we want to. And kind of like you, lots of the students discuss between them ourselves, like we can see where they overlap and where they're beginning to like merge together. So I think there could be sort of a future where they're not so <coughs> segregated as they are at the moment. I'm studying criminology and cultural studies, and actually I can tell totally what the problem is, okay? You kind of, if, if, if anyone who ever been to a city, if I turn around to my Trinidadian, Irish, travelling Jewish kids and said to them, people are different, they'd be like, duh. <laughs> you've, already got, you've already got the building bricks in front of you. People in the cities already know people are different because actually they're voting with their genitals. The biggest growth, growth in the population is among mixed race people. People already know that everyone's different, and they're actually they're living it. You're telling them that, 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 that people are different. They're just getting on with it. And actually, 
actually, that's quite patronising. That's quite patronising. I think if, if you if you use what's there already, especially in reference to education, because education at the moment is really squeezed. I've got teenage children. My daughter's just done her options. Her options are the choice between geography and history, and then one other option on top of that. Okay, so you're not going to go, I don't think you're going to be able to go in there as a separate subject. You're going to have to squeeze your way into lots of different subjects. You're going to have to squeeze yourself in historically. You're going to have to squeeze yourself in geographically, and you can like really kick some ass in a PhD subject. But you are not going to be able to create a different, a different subject because the way that the government is running education at the moment, you're, you're not going to get anything. I think, I mean, I did mention in 15 minutes, we obviously don't have that much time. But I did mention that that's something we have taken into consideration and we do want to spend more time to look into what national curriculum they're already doing. I'm you know, completely aware that they have things like global citizenship as part of the curriculum. Plus they bring anthropological kind of ideas into geography. And like I said, we already appreciate that schools are under a lot of pressure and that there's always new initiatives. I mean, before doing my degree I've worked in education myself and I appreciate that teachers are under so much pressure new initiatives coming in all of the time and that's why we don't necessarily want to make this a part of the curriculum, something that's embedded within the syllabus we want to do something that is workshop days and sorry? Um, the point is, if I understand what you're saying but you are not going to get anywhere if you don't work within the structure that's already there. They've got already, in, this, in, in the schools that my kids attend to, they've already dropped art because they can't fit in the curriculum subjects that they, they need to do. If you, if you don't work initially within the system, you're not even going to get a look in. But there, are, there, are, there is space within the curriculum if you actually challenge the curriculum itself. I mean, just, just in history, if you look at the history GCSE O level curriculum, it's all about Second World War. When actually Cameron is, Cameron wants us to embrace the big society. The only way we can do that is by by embracing the people within our society, not the ways that not the ways that we divide it. And I think you have to go for the curriculum rather than so the teachers. Can I get a response, and then I think we're going to move on to a question. Thank you. Um, like I appreciate what you're saying. We want to make these workshops something that can feed into the curriculum. And having done some, admittedly, small amount of research so far um, with primary education, um, especially schools that are implementing the international schools curriculum within their national curriculum, they're really excited about the kind of project that we're working on and feel that it does fill in and can slot into their curriculum. Um, and they quite often bring in workshop days. For example, if they're working on poetry, they'll bring in a poet to do a workshop day with the students. Um, it is a very infantile project, and we want to spend a lot more time really developing that. Um, Plus, I don't think the fact that classrooms are multi-ethnic is adverse to what a project is. I don't see why that would... Yeah, that's that would, the point yeah. that I'm making. Actually, you, you're already halfway there. If you go into... Uh, like, for example, we, we come from East London. There's over 40 different cultures and subcultures in my kids' school. If you go and stand in front of those kids and say, everyone's different, they're going to be like... Yeah, we know. Yeah, yeah, no, but I, no, but I, I mean, I've moved, I've moved from Labra Grove out to suburbs probably like 20 miles and didn't meet a single ethnically different kid from all the middle class white kids. And I had that, I was, I was so shocked that none of them had ever encountered anyone of a different culture. Well, you should have moved from Labra Grove to Ladies' Bone. No, 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 it's not my parents' choice. I think what you're saying, I understand where you're coming from, but. I think you're very privileged that you're from a mixed race background in an area because not everyone is like that. Like I come from Essex and there's like two black people in my whole school. And people don't know that it's different. They, 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 they don't, you know, you, people don't know what anthropology is and they don't know that people are different. In London, yes, it's very multicultural, but, and I think that's a brilliant, I think that is so good, but I think anthropology is the best way to do that. Like what you're saying, 
is, oh, I don't think you're going the right way about it, but actually it is, because that's what anthropology is. Yeah. So Can I just so interrupt? Like, sorry. <laughs> just while we're talking about this, like, I understand that it's, and I like the fact that because we're in London, that everyone, you know, there's lots of mix and stuff, but I think we also need to focus on the fact that even though lots of people, you know, are, we're still in a Western context. With the, the examples that we were showing were completely outside of, you know, the UK. And even if, and I understand that there is a lot of mix and if people come from different cultures, they bring that in, but we're introducing completely different from that, you know, where they're not. Can I can just. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, it's just as a person from Leytonstone um, <laughs> who, who has taught in a school in Leytonstone uh, as a teaching assistant. Um, I just wanted to bring in the aspect of my Andres talk very quickly, um, which is two key points. One is um, that I might be being slightly exagger exaggerating in this, but um, anthropology is playing a game of a holistic approach, which is decreasing in every other disciplinary area that I have at least been engaged in. This is, this is not a minor aspect, and this reductionist approach is part and parcel of um, where, where we're living and how we're taught already. In, and you might think it's funny in, what I'm, in, in relation to my talk, but it's to do with wanting instant results. So when me and Andrew are talking about tangible results, it does not mean we want instant pills to solve problems right now. It's to make any results tangible in, in the real world. So, yeah, it, this idea of reduction has to be taken into consideration. And then on top of that, in relation to Ravenel's work, um, is that anthropology works in some aspects as, an in, uh, as, as a more holistic introduction to what are already highly focused reductionist subjects. So if it, if it wants to deal with other subjects, then it, a, it, it can either work on bringing a holistic approach to them, which exists in many anthropology mm. papers already, um, as I've been informed, luckily, by some of the professors at this university. Um, but I, I guess my general point is that it's... I'm, I'm entering into the point of being an, an arrogant social anthropologist and thinking because you haven't done anthropology, you don't get it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, no, but this is, this is what I'm saying is the problem. Um, and I don't know how to solve it, but I don't know. I guess I went off on a, on a tangent. I'll take my point. I would just like to do education um, with everything you've got. And I think that between the in and out of the high you on that would, would work to help you. Because um, being from Dorset, which, it, you know, is. Yes, enough. Yeah, Dorset, Dorset. 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 And, and, and I study in London, so I, I've experienced both, both of those.
younger groups, it would make a massive difference, you know. And I think maybe maybe I didn't make my point properly. I think the fact that we mix so easily means everyone is interested in what the difference is in people. But you've got a massive war you're fighting against, and that's the English Education Society. Yeah. It's really yeah, hard to penetrate that. Very exciting. Here we are. Uh, Andrea, you there? Gabriel? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just uh, quickly wanted just to say something about what you were saying about um, like putting anthropology into history and geography. I think. <coughs> with like what anthropology is also it's not just content it's like an approach to things so if you put it into like like the history approach to things or the job then it won't really do what anthropology like more to teach people what it's trying to teach them you can't just like put some anthropology facts into it I think, I think the British education system needs a bit more reflective about its colonial history because I mean that was the most I mean that's I mean like anthropology <laughs> Was born out of that. We can't, we can't deny this, but we've been doing a lot of self-flagellation about that. Let's <laughs> help, let's help the rest of England be a bit self-flagellant as well, because I've seen, I've seen more and more people talking about colonialism in such a positive way, and it freaks me out. <laughs> um, I quickly just wanted to ask you a question about the um, the primary school project. Um, do you feel like with the with the questions that the kids might have has, asked you, um, did you feel like you were also kind of learning stuff about anthropology or like finding new questions about anthropology uh, through the reflection of the... We had um, before, like so we did our pilot day in at the end of December on like the 20th and we started this back in September and almost consecutively, consecutively for about three months we'd meet for two hours and argue bitterly about what exactly we thought anthropology was, what exactly we thought anthropology should be teaching, what exactly we thought we should do. So there was a lot of sort of searching in regards to, you know, what actually we're learning, what actually we're trying to teach. Um, and then when you sort of bring it down, because you have to bring it down from what we're learning at degree level, right down to sort of what eight or nine-year-olds can understand. And sort of like in doing that, there was a lot of... I think there's a lot of like learning that I, and reflection that but, you But I mean, done. also through like what the what questions the kids then ask you, mm. like you know whatever question that might sound stupid to someone who's been studying anthropology for three years, but then kind of like because it kind of goes into what uh, Abby and Andreas talked was about all <coughs> these kind of questions that come back that you just leave outside of the boundaries of the discipline. Um, I mean, one of the things, I mean. I don't know if anyone's worked with kids. They come up with the funniest things. <laughs> like, literally, things that make you go, oh, you're amazing. And combining that with our philosophy behind teaching, you know, we didn't want to go in there and be like, this is anthropology, A, B, and C. We've taught you this. You know, we kind of really gave the students space. Just, like, prompting them here and there for them to be like, oh, you know, what's this? And, so, I mean, I can't think of any examples now, but... The things that they come out with make you realise that what is really clear <coughs> in your mind, they might be taking something completely different, and that in itself is interesting. Yeah, um, I think you raise a good point in that this could be, if we rolled out more workshops, it could be good for us, it could be good for anthropologists to be bringing it down to the basics and teaching um, in primary schools just for a day or a couple of days. It's a valuable experience for undergraduates as, as well as a can I ask you a question? Just um, bouncing off the ladies' questions that you brought up a good time. How I just wondered how much um, you, in the in your syllabus you drew on um, like people's own backgrounds within the classroom rather than just people's backgrounds outside the classroom. I don't know because, as you said, you have a really short conversation. Yeah. Well, one of the things I think is really important in education is like always bringing it back to the self. So like I. I mean, I know I'm talking to the converted. Anthropology is not necessarily about difference. It's about similarity and difference. And like that's what we're trying to show these students is that they might do things differently, but actually, how similar are they? You know, and like, okay, yeah, you can get into arguments of like universalism and relativism, fine. But we're talking about eight-year-olds, um, so. It might be kind of a, a crude starting point, but we. We, as well as bringing in uh, baskets from the Congo and masks and things like that, we wanted them to bring in their own objects so that there'd be some room for comparison. Yeah, it's really important for us to like, bring it back to the self. <coughs>
That's that's what that's part of what, what I what I mean. So I'll give a like an example. Um, I, I I went out to obviously this is comparatively minor, but for a month of field work, um, talking to the fishermen. The reason I went was for a very innocent question I had as a kid, which was why don't people really eat fish in an island in the middle of the sea? Um, very unanthropological question. Um, because then you start to realise that it's just not that simple. Um, and then I got a second question, which was, why are these people still doing this job? Because it's so... Like, there are no fish, basically, is one of the main reasons. Um, and many other things. And then this led me to, why am I here talking to, to these guys who are just basically, like, dying off? And what is my role in this? And so I was... I, it might be a bit of a monetary way to do it, but I was like, right, they're giving me something, I need to give them something. So I said, I'll translate my dissertation and give it back to them. Um, and also, so therefore they're an audience and my people marketing an audience, so I have to justify what I'm saying to both of them without making up a load of crap or extrapolated uh, stuff that I cannot necessarily handle and they can't handle. Um, a, I got a, s a slight... Um, shock when I was told, wow, that's, that's, that's really cool you're translating for them. I'm sorry, am I, am I, from, from the way I feel about it, that's not really cool. If you don't translate it and give it back to someone, then, that, then, then what was the point in ethics for? Obviously that's a debate with engaged anthropology, etc, etc. But that's an aspect of it. But that is what, what we're trying to say is, obviously it was my personal uh, values, which was that it's very important that they have an active way of getting out of their problem because the problem is that they're just being killed off by overfishing. So it's a simple, tangible area of how to apply what was an innocent question before and how can I apply this. And it, and it just, it, the three years that I don't, just don't seem to have helped to do that, I'm really having to draw on me as a person to be able to solve that, which is fine. It's just not quite fine, obviously. I just I had a kind of practical comment, I suppose, that follows on from your question about the self and the learning. And we've talked a lot about education, and it's very clear that I think probably most of the people in the room would agree that anthropology is kind of dispositional. But I think it's also important to remember that even in the university setting, the other we need to look at the end result of that and kind of assessment processes. And I would love. I think UCL could do with a talk like yours in the department. Because it's actually, I think it's really important to let people have the freedom to play with the boundaries. And yes, there's a kind of academic framework that it's got to adhere to, and there's monetary issues and all those kind of things. But if you don't let the students run with it, then there's kind of no point to doing it. So I think it's important to remind anthropology kind of as an academic Force, that actually they do need to be flexible and innovative in the way they actually assess students and let them use the information they're learning. Do you pass that box now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So, uh, okay. Um, yeah? Yes. yes. This is sort of a, uh, I don't know, a bit of a meta question commentary to uh, both what you're doing and also sort of the whole what cognitivism, um, <laughs> because if we're sort of talking about going into school, absolutely brilliant initiative, um, I think I've told you so before, but like, kudos to you for doing it. Um, but there's some, there's sort of a, um, are we going in and talking about sort of different worlds, different worldviews, are we talking about like, it's the whole uh, perspectivism problem of whether it's a different world or whether it's a different, I think the question about drawing on, on people's backgrounds already. It's assuming that everyone has a sort of shared world in the West. So sort of showing um, the stuff that you're doing with sort of people who have radically alterity, alter ways of being in the world. It's a very interesting project to be going into doing it. Um, my sort of reflective questions, which I suppose goes to you guys, it's in a sense like what that then 
implies in terms of teaching this to kids, what we're telling them that it's a different world, different culture, different sort of cognitive. Does that make sense? Yeah, one thing that we made that came out in our discussion yesterday was the fact that Bloch's argument is based completely on the fact that we accept a evolutionary framework. evolutionary framework of okay, yeah. mankind, which is which is deeply embedded into your subject. Mm. And to this ex to this extent, when we look at sort of the more kind of um, agnostic, uh, what's it called? Um, what's the parallel parallel um, ontologies? Are we how far do you want to take that? Are we really escaping the fact that? I mean, are we bound as the blo as block proposes? We not sh aren't we just tying this down to a very material idea of what man is? I mean, that's really one thing that came to mind when I was listening to what you were saying was what's really exciting. This idea of charging intuitions at this age, um, children. I tend to find I'm from my background is um, my father's um, family is Sikh, my mother's family. Are, or Welsh, but they're a fairly poor um, family. So in, the, in my father's uh, context in Leeds, there's a lot of um, uh, ethnic difficulty with the Pakistani community. Um, and um, they tend to, although they've got a, a kind of meta-narrative about, yes, we are just different people, different um, kinds of beliefs, there's an underlying sense that there are different kinds of people. And um, they situate that in the same world, like I say. So there are different kinds of people in this world. This is the way that we agree with. There's this other kind, but they just don't think like us. But that's why I recognise, but they just don't think like us. Um, they're already making them into kind of like many natural kinds of people. And I think what would be really fascinating with children that young is to do the kind of counterintuitive work that Rita does with the children when she goes to Madagascar. <coughs> to sort of see, um, you know, basically like, well, if you, you know, if this child was adopted by this family, would they become visa, or you know, what would they, what are they going to look like, and this sort of thing, and to understand that other children have different beliefs about that, yeah. it'd be really fascinating because it's for a start it challenges his um, biological essentialism at a young age, but it's also just when you when you when you get the really fascinating evolutionary things you're talking about, you've got this other thing going in the background yeah. just that gets it off. And I think that definitely feeds into like your first comment about you know these, this multidisciplinary field. You know there is room for them to go like this, but there's also room for them to yeah. do this, and I think that's why people try, and it is difficult, and I yeah. don't know what the answer is, and I think we should endeavour to try, um, but I think. At, at, a, at our age group at eight, yeah. you know, we have to really break this down. But I don't see any reason why, if we were to like expand on the syllabus and you know take it into secondary. I mean, there is obviously already the A level, but like if you went to GCSE sort of level, why you couldn't bring you know ideas of perspectivism in and things like that. Okay, sorry, I think I obviously what you're saying. I mean, so like, have we got time for one more? Um, if you had to. I was just going to ask, because we wanted to, in relation to that, we wanted to emphasise the narrative element in all three prongs. So, for example, in biological uh, anthropology, we perhaps uh, give some basic uh, facts, like encephalisation, um, uh, gathering techniques, um, uh, tool use, and uh, bipedalism, and things like that, and then emphasise the, the narrative framework in which humans operate, so uh, allow them to um, put them into different positions within the framework with, and, and emphasise that uh, technique of thought that we use so that for some students it might, they might hypothesise, even uh, for them to um, practically do it, so imagine themselves walking before they uh, were swinging or things like that, so that we emphasise that everything is embedded within a narrative. I don't know what you think about even the, the assumption of, of narrative. And with the, the, uh, the social anthropology, we did discuss the idea of giving a mini ethnography of, uh, I don't know, a little girl in rural India, and then imagining doing a role play where you, you embody that personality and carry it out. But I'd be interested to know how yeah, you think. Yeah, I think we'll <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, guys.